In the previous segment, we discussed the importance of adherence to antiretroviral therapy and various medication and patient factors which contribute to non-adherence. In the next segment, we will discuss the challenges, solutions and innovative approaches to care which health providers have developed in response to adherence challenges. We will listen again to both our experts and from our experience ARV providers in the field. For providers, there are a number of issues where we as, as healthcare workers can improve adherence. First of all, we need to explain things. Education is key. People need to be prepared to take antiretroviral therapy. They need to understand what is expected of them, what HIV is. And um, this can be done on an individual basis or it can be done um, in a group. I would say the commonest cause of non-adherence is lack of knowledge why the patients are actually swallowing the medication. Uh, patients do not see a reason to swallow drugs, especially when they are well. The challenge just that they are facing here is when they are given the information. Whoever is giving information needs to be very careful and make sure, ensure that the patients understand what they are talking about. From the, the beginning, when they are prepared for art, the resistance issues must be brought into treatment failure. So I think involving patients, educating them, using the language that they understand, treating them with respect, make them understand. One-on-one -on -one education um, is also very valuable for patients. Quite often we don't have time to actually do one-on-one -on -one education with the numbers of people that are coming through our clinics and that's where group sessions can be very useful. Multidisciplinary education and counselling interventions can be um, good as well. That is having your clinician say a little bit about adherence, your counsellor say a little bit about adherence, then your pharmacist or your um, uh, whoever is dispensing the medication to say a little bit about adherence as well. So that every at every point where you meet a, a, a healthcare practitioner, you are getting some information about um, improving your adherence. Peer support can be useful, that is basically asking someone to bring in a treatment partner, somebody from home who can help them take their tablets, who can remind them at night, who can um, encourage them on those days when taking a tablet feels like it's, it's a quite a hot, large burden. Sometimes people fear to disclose, yet when eventually they disclose to the family members, the, the family members support them. So other than educating, you also need to be monitoring what is actually happening in your, with your patient as they take their treatment from a day -to -day, on a day-to-day -day basis. So when they come into you at week four on treatment or month two or even year two or year three on treatment, you should ask them, how is it going with your adherence? Are you managing to take your tablets every day? Don't be judgmental, just ask the questions. And a lot, most people will say to you, doctor, I'm doing fine, I take my medication every day. If you, the average self-reported adherence for most studies is, is 100%. But occasionally people do tell you, no, I've struggled, I didn't take my doses in the last few days. And that gives you a window to actually explore what has gone on with that patient, check for depression and other things that can be um, undermining their adherence behavior. You can also check for using pharmacy refill data. So if you can get from an electronic system or by looking back in their folders how many times they've collected their medication over the last year, that is also extremely useful. Someone who's collected nine or less um, uh, months of medication in the past year is obviously not taking tablets every day. The other way of supporting adherence as a, as a clinician is reminding people to take their medication. So you, 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 you could offer people a pill box. Um, and you should also, as a provider, notice if a visit is missed. We need to monitor that people are coming to their, uh, their uh, visits regularly. And in large clinics, it's very easy to um, fail to notice that a person has not arrived. And sometimes it can be six weeks to three months before we notice that someone hasn't actually collected medication. In South Africa, during a national survey of over 2,300 facilities, one in five facilities faced a stockout of at least one life-saving HIV or TB drug. Pharmacy and stock reporting measures have to be in place to prevent drug stockouts and patients and staff have to be educated on contingency measures in case of stockout. But also when they access the health centres, sometimes there are other challenges, such as waiting hours that are long, alongside drug stockouts, and maybe sometimes having very few healthcare providers at the centre. Drug stockouts definitely will mean when a patient turns up to pick their drugs, they won't get the drug and that means they will have to wait until the drug is available. 
and since there's a distance problem and other challenges, they might not be back for a month or two or they have to go back to work. And that means during this time they're off drugs and that might really require or result in loss of adherence and then eventually that might contribute to resistance when they go back to the drugs. Also as providers, we need to be flexible we don't have to have doctors see every patient that comes through. We can use nurses. We can also use counsellors to educate our patients rather than clinicians. So where resources are limited, we can be flexible. We can actually modify our service that is offered. Sometimes it's possible, like patients who tell you they're going to travel for a long time and not be available for their next appointment. You might try to refill them for two months or three months, but sometimes the drugs are not available. In amounts that will enable you to give them long stocks. So that can also be a challenge. But many times there's a little bit of flexibility, if possible. At the Guguletu um, antiretroviral site here in Cape Town, we have um, treatment preparedness sessions that run on um, Mondays, but also on Saturdays to, care, to cater for those people who are working. When one thinks about um, adherence, if you look at the patient journey, we spend a significant amount of time at the beginning um, talking about adherence and ensuring that our patients are ready to start their treatment. Uh, but later on, when our patients are stable, uh, the ones who are really stable and adherent, they continue to come to the clinic on time, collect their treatment and take their treatment as they should. We should be considering innovative strategies to ensure that we keep them in care. An example of these innovative strategies could be the adherence club model, where a group of stable patients come together, not only so that they are empowered to self-manage, um, continue to get peer support from other patients just like them, but furthermore, they continue have to have contact with the health system and the routine clinical management. The adherence club are addressing the waiting times because these are stable patients that are coming to the clinic every month coming to pick up medication, then you absolutely just take a wait on this patient and the patient has to sit for five hours waiting for you to call the patient again and prescribe so that the patient can go to pharmacy. So we started this adherence club where we group 30 patients in a group. Then these patients will come on a certain day. Then they will come. You prepare their medication, at, uh, their folders a day before. So when they come on their appointment day, you know, they are in the clinic for less than an hour or for an hour in the clinic. So we saw it working at Ubuntu, but we take it a step further from Ubuntu. We started it in the community. We started at the library closer to the clinic. Then now we even have clubs that are happening in patients' homes where a patient will open up their home, where plus minus 10 or 15 patients will gather there and their medication will be given there. Another example of these community models are CAGs, community art groups. Um, these, this model is more suited for a more rural context where distance to facility is a significant challenge. In this model, patients take turns in collecting treatment for their group. So this ensures that each patient makes routine contact with the system and the rest of the patients continue to be able to receive their treatment routinely. As providers, we have to adapt these various community models of care and be flexible within our different environments. Another very important factor is that we do viral loads as part of monitoring of our antiretroviral service and we need to act on those viral loads. Um, a raised viral load indicates a risk of failure, so at that point we need to do something. The first viral load up doesn't necessarily mean that somebody has developed resistance, it just means they haven't taken enough drug to suppress their virus successfully. And at that point you can actually try and resuppress them with an adherence intervention, including a number of the factors we've spoken about already, perhaps um, re-education, offering a pill box, exploring whether there's issues with alcohol or depression, whether their disclosure is up to date, um, and, 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 and other things things like that that can improve adherence. And about 56 to 68 percent can resuppress with uh, an adherence intervention. So what I'm doing with the adults, you know, we have to teach the, the nurses first how to identify 
the patients that are having a virological failure, then the nurse that will be doing that, you should be able to, that nurse should be able to flag those patients and do something, not just flagging the patients, and do something about it. Without a good record system to identify these patients, the results can keep coming, but no one actually identifies them. So what, you, what we do, we teach the nurses, you know, starting from the first page of the, of the folder, that's where they should be learning to, to write in the results so that you could see the patient, how long was this patient failing. The practical tips would be vigilance in terms of record keeping at the health center, early identification of the cases, ideally best done by a lab test such as a viral load, which notifies the clinician that something has to be done, and then actioning of this, which might entail informing a village health worker to fix an appointment with the patient, link up with the counselor, and ensure that adherence is done at the health center. So one of the big things we discuss with our patients is about integrating treatment into their lives. And a way in which we can help um, for those who work in the health system is to ensure that we consider innovative, flexible strategies that we can adapt um, to our context to ensure that we encourage patients to have easy access to their treatment and they're committed to staying on treatment for the rest of their lives. Patient education and peer support are very important, with an emphasis on addressing risk factors and ensuring an understanding of the reasons for adherence. Monitoring of adherence can be done via pharmacy refills, pill counts and an open dialogue and medication reminders with patients should be ensured. Detectable viral loads are an important objective measure of possible non-adherence and have to be actioned upon. 60% of patients can resuppress after enhanced adherence interventions. Lastly, providers should be flexible and tailor various solutions and models of care to suit the specific context or population served.